Well, uh, I have to say it's, it's an honor to be here, especially given that most of us haven't had conferences in so long. Uh, I just did DEF CON in, in July and it was an amazing experience to be back amongst my people again and mm -hmm. to actually be able to sit down and talk to people who could understand what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's awesome. So, uh, I, I, I kind of struggled with what to talk about because um, I haven't actually done my usual research during the, the pandemic. So instead, I figured I'd talk a bit about uh, the social side of hacking and hacktivism and sort of where it's come from and where it's going and gone. Because I think a lot of people think that hacktivism is just one sort of dimensional thing. Um, people breaking into websites, dumping files, that kind of stuff. There's actually a, a lot more to it. And I'm going to go into that. So, um, is it up? Yep, yeah, okay. Oh, so my biography, um, I'm the hacker who looks like Santa Claus. Um, I didn't look like this before COVID. It was li literally COVID that did this to me. Um, and it's debatable whether I'm going to keep it or not, uh, at least till Christmas anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, what I say, I'm head of security at DEF CON, VP of uh, cybersecurity at Okta. Uh, one of the founders of the CTI League, along with Nate. Um, oh yeah, tech advisor to Mr. Robots. Um, I'm part of the CDC and the CDC Ninja Strike Force, and I generally break stuff. Uh, so this is probably one of the first things I've done where I'm not breaking something. This is a, a quote from Veggie last night, and he says, Hacktivism is more vibrant and alive than it has ever been. And I would agree with him. You just have to look at where it's gone. So hack hacktivism is a, a social or political activist act that's carried out by breaking into or wreaking havoc on a secure computer system. That was the definition from, um, I don't remember who wrote it, someone back in the, in the 90s. I actually completely disagree with this. I don't think that's hacktivism. I think that can be an aspect of hacktivism. I think hacktivism much better aligns with the MIT definition of what a hacker is. And, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about this. Um, so, a little bit of inception. Uh, here is a video of an opening keynote in an opening keynote. Um, and it was for an opening keynote. Um, Basically, in 1997, Beyond Hope uh, paired up with Hacking in Progress. And while the conferences were linking up, we hacked Hacking in Progress and owned all the computers in the tents and owned the uh, campsite computer. And basically, as they woke up and did their opening keynote, we announced to them that they'd just been completely owned. Um, and this video is of that moment. And it's basically me sitting with Fiber Optic, Death Veggie, and Cheshire Catalyst. Before we began here, we decided to visit the, uh, the web page of our sister conference, Hacking in Progress, uh, the HIP conference. And uh, as it turned out, uh, it wasn't secure. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks to Cyber Junkie here. Uh, maybe he could explain um, what it was that was done or not done. Yeah, I. Um, don't we look like that anymore. To, uh, this, this URL, again, no www here. Uh, it's guide.campsite.hip97.nl. I'm not sure if they fixed it or modified it or, or whatnot, but uh, they have a little diary going there of what's happening. Hip97.nl. Hip not hipnet, hip97. You can see the technical side of conferences hasn't been Yeah, we are waiting either. for something in particular, okay. Oh, that's bad. Hopefully by tomorrow we'll have the terminal up here so, so we can actually <laughs> type as we speak. That would be neat. Okay, connecting over to Holland now. Okay, this is the online diary. They're keeping a diary from their campsite. Can we scroll down? Keep scrolling. OK, 
Okay, this is the hip uh, Friday morning section. I like the font. <laughs> Click on it where it says hacked page there. <laughs> So, to most people, that's hacktivism. It's like breaking into somebody's site, putting up some additional content, maybe doing a web defacement, um, like some of the examples here. Uh, but the reality is, out of most of these actions, the only ones that have persistence are things like the Pentagon Papers, where substantial material was dumped that ultimately changed things because of the exposure of the information. When it comes to the big web defacements of the 90s, I doubt anyone in this room remembers any of them. Um, and what you're looking at there is, uh, the top is uh, the CIA homepage being defaced, and to the bottom right is the uh, Labour Party webpage uh, just after Tony Blair was elected. And so those were big deals at the time, but they didn't really last. And so my kind of thesis is that the more traditional view of hacktivism isn't really that persistent or effective in making change. And there are other ways to do it. And the other thing is because of this, this is pretty much what the world perceives hacktivists to be. Um, we're scary people who wear masks and we break into things. And that's actually less helpful than you might imagine. Um, in the, the work that I've been doing over the, throughout the pandemic, I now find myself sitting with law enforcement officials, governments, uh, NGOs, and it makes it really, really difficult. And Nate here can t testify to one of the biggest challenges we had was as we found vulnerabilities in facilities like hospitals, having one of us go up and knock on the door and say, hey, you've got a massively exposed piece of infrastructure that some Russian gang could come in, infiltrate with ransomware and cause huge problems, they just freak out. Like, they think it's some sort of shakedown, they think hackers are scary, they don't see any potential benefit in it. This image is really not great. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I set out uh, with Mr. Robot to try and change some of that image. Um, I got given an opportunity to work from inside a TV series and guide them on what they used. And one of the first rules I put down was only use realistic techniques that a hacker would use and only use community tools, the things that we know people are using. Um, and I, why does hacktivism itself even have to focus on these offensive technologies? You know, aren't there other ways that we can make change using the skills that we have? If you look at the original definition of what a hacker is, you know, it came out of the MIT Model Railway Club. It was essentially somebody who could change a system uh, without destroying it, i.e. adapt a system from within or make a, a modification to it that didn't destroy the original purpose but gained an additional purpose. And I like to think that's the best approach to hacking. It's going in and changing systems in such a way that you get an outcome that you want, but without necessarily destroying its original purpose. And I think you can apply the same thing to hacktivism. And so that brings up the CTI League. Nate, if you want to join me. I kind of feel it's only fair because he co-founded this with me. Um, so the idea behind the CTI League was really just thrown together. A, a bunch of us were not doing a lot during the pandemic. Um, we we're sitting in front of keyboards, locked in our houses, lots of extra cycles to spend. Uh, and we wanted to defend healthcare because we could see criminals targeting healthcare more and more. Um, so like, we came together. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, like that's like just like Mark said. Um, I think we started it on March 13th of 2020. Um, some of the impetus behind it, uh, I had just come back from Israel. I had done a talk about using tools like Shodan and uh, Grainoise to assess network perimeter and find holes in the, the gaps of your network. Some of which you're going to see later today. 
Um, so I'm sitting at work at Microsoft and I see this article about a Czech hospital that had just been ransomware, right? And I had this sort of like nightmare light bulb moment of like, this is a thing. So I use my access, I download all the, you know, exposed, I think they were F5 devices at the time. Um, no, I'm sorry, they were Citrix Net Scalers. I pull them all down out of the internet, start doing some, you know, command line magic, and lo and behold, I find my own hospital, like the doctors that put my shoulder together after a snowboarding accident, has two of these Net Scaler, uh, net scaler devices, and I'm just like, what do I do? So I, I quite literally went on LinkedIn, um, because they didn't have a security contact. I go to the hospital, there's no security people, like there's people to call for physical security if, you know, I need to be walked to the parking lot. But there was no link for any like information security team, no way to reach them. So I find a guy on LinkedIn who says he works for the hospital, send him a connect request, try to stuff into 200 characters like, hey, I found some stuff that's exposed, I'm not trying to hack you, I'm a patient, I just want you to know this thing, nothing. Um, and like Mark says, that's, that, was, that was the moment where I was like, this is a huge problem and there's no way I can solve it. Um, so another gentleman, Ohad, had reached out and said, do you want to start this thing with me? And I'm like, sure, I'll jump in, I'll help out. We assumed we'd have maybe 30, 40 people playing around in their spare time. I think within a month we had 1,500 people from around the world. It was like 120 countries that were represented. Um, even a gentleman from the Faroe Islands had joined us. Um, so yeah, it was... We managed to stop a lot of attacks. We worked ended up partnering with U.S. government agencies, um, Europol, Interpol, the NHS UK. The list just goes on and on. And it was really kind of powerful to be able to say, hey, we have all these skills. We're putting them to use. We're pr trying to defend hospitals for free. Um, but like to Mark's point, we couldn't, they wouldn't listen to us. We had to partner with what are called ISACs in the U.S. Um, and let them, that somebody that trusted, that they already trusted, talk to them. Because every time we went and reached out, like you said, it would be everything from what are you talking about to how much money are you trying to blackmail me to like, we need to get our lawyers involved. And we're like, no, 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 no. We're just trying to tell you for free that you need to go fix this before somebody gets in. <laughs> and one of the biggest thing, things that came out of this for me was we were sitting down with uh, some of the um, agencies we were working with and they basically said, we have never worked with civilians in this manner. And it's produced results that we just couldn't, didn't expect at all. It's, in a way, now created a model that I'm seeing replicated. I'm a member of at least four other groups now that are doing the same thing in different areas. So, for example, if any of you have heard of the uh, uh, Special Task Force on Ransomware, I'm part of the Ransomware Task Force, and that's operating in a similar model, bringing together private sector individuals to work and assist so that we can um, act as force multipliers. It's probably the best way of looking at it because government agencies don't have enough people to deal with this stuff. And even if they did, they're gonna prioritize uh, big things. And I'll, I'll mention this later on, but you know, small businesses don't have the resources and they don't have the budget and they don't have any like the people to solve these problems. But if we're not fixing them, then we're really not fixing anyone. We're just fixing the giant hospitals of the world. And that's not going to help any of us. Um, One quote. The best quote that we heard when we were in there was somebody from uh, the CISA agency in the United States told us that we did in a month what the US government had tried and failed to do for 10 years, which was pretty cool. And I mean, what this boils down to is this is what the hacker mindset can do when it's applied to government. This is working on the inside to change the way they're doing things. And there's still a ton of work to do because a lot of these uh, agencies are still incredibly reticent to engage. They don't understand the trust models inside private sector and inside hackerspace. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's working. I'll skip over this. This, is like, this is the stuff we found in the first, um, first month, basically lots of old shit stuff that should really have been fixed long ago but you know to the resourcing problem yeah a lot of them knew about this stuff thank you a lot of them knew about this stuff but they just didn't have the people to fix it these are some of the agencies that we ended up working with um, about 10 percent of the membership came from government and law enforcement and from agencies all over the world. Nate mentioned the Faroe Islands. They had the Faroe Islands uh, cyber police represented. I, I had no idea the Faroe Islands had a cyber police. Um, 
people from pretty much every continent. And that gave us reach that was just unprecedented. So, what was the view of hacking on TV and the view of hackers before Mr. Robot came along? I think, you know, we've all seen CSI, we've all seen Scorpion. Like, that's the reason I got involved in the Mr. Robot side of it. And the reason I essentially worked to hack Hollywood was I just, oh, yeah. And of course, afterwards, that's where we ended up. But I, any of you who have watched Mr. Robot, do any of you find any faults in any of the hacks or any of the technologies used? So it's doable. We can make these shows do the right thing. And it actually becomes a PR opportunity for us because it shows the world what we can do in a responsible way and it shows our power. So what are the other areas that we can hack in? Um, policy is a huge one. There are several bills going through right now that have hackers involved to some extent or, or not. Um, you can generally spot them. Uh, if you look up things like uh, the Improving uh, IoT Cybersecurity Act of 2020 in the US, and you look at the fact that it's got some really sensible requirements in there. You know, it doesn't go far enough, but it's got some brilliant first steps. That's because the people who are helping advise had knowledge. And the reason they had knowledge is because some of us were connected to them and helping them with that. The reviews of things like the Com Computer Misuse Act or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US, same deal. We've got people pushing from different directions to improve this stuff and fix it. And so we can literally rewrite the laws that have been used against us. And this is a huge opportunity for us. And I want to see more people engage in this way. You know, talk to politicians, talk to aides, talk to uh, government groups, plug into all of these people and give them the knowledge that you have because it's guaranteed to be 100 times more than they already have access to. And if you help shape them, then the outcome is going to be way more beneficial to you and to your future careers. Uh, well, it's, oh, counter cybercrime activities. So ransomware task force. We are looking at working to uh, shape what industry does. In an industry, we are already taking countermeasures against cybercrime. And what we can do is profoundly different from what government can do. You know, government has to follow uh, due process, they have to follow various treaties like MLAT, and the chances of them dropping uh, an arrest warrant on, say, a, a Ukrainian cyber criminal are slim to none. And sanctions being levied against random Russian dudes who then jump into their Lamborghinis and drive off is not going to stop anything. But through private sector, we have access to trust relationships. We have access to uh, organizational relationships. And all of these things can be used and can be weaponized against the economy that these people are part of. This is a view that government has never really looked at before. You know, they like to use sledgehammers to crack walnuts. But we can be a lot more subtle about it. And we can do it lawfully without having to jump through the same hoops that government has to follow. And the last one is um, the, uh, the cybersecurity poverty line. Uh, just looking at, say, uh, the United States, about two-thirds of American medical infrastructure is in five or ten-person facilities. And those facilities are not covered by any of the stuff that you see going on. You know, what are you going to do? Walk into a five-person dentist's office and tell them to follow the NIST cybersecurity framework? It, I can tell you it's not going to have any benefit. What we can do, though, is we can upscale and we can help supply knowledge to people like the MSSPs and to those facilities and do the kind of work that the CTI League was doing to provide resources to these organizations that don't have it and to help shape what they're doing and provide protection for them.
So what do we need to do? Um, I mean, basically, we just need to keep on doing what we do best. And we need to show the world that we are better at cybersecurity than any of them. And we need to use the skills that we have to change stuff from within, the truest form of hacking. And, well, let's not be the meme, like, let's not be the guys in masks who are um, scaring people and who are uh, causing arbitrary damage. Uh, opportunistic stuff can work. But I think targeted, deliberate, uh, st staged work is always going to be better, longer lasting, and more effective. Hack the planet. <laughs> Questions or? Yeah, anyone have any questions? Yeah. We have a second mic. Sir, from your experience, if you work for a governmental organization or law enforcement function, what are the first steps that they should take to better embrace you? What are the first steps that they should take or that you should take? Uh, trust and information flow. Because one of the biggest challenges we have is when you're working on specific projects, targeting groups, you have to deconflict what you're doing from what the government's doing. But it's impossible to do that without a flow of information. Many government agencies provide a single channel, i.e. they receive. They'll take information from you, they'll go off and do stuff with it. But they won't feed back and tell you, actually, we're working on this or... Uh, this is going to be a problem because of that. They may tell you to stop, but they're not going to give you guidance. And that lack of guidance means you can't um, coordinate efforts. And the reality is if we want to be um, uh, effective against groups like Russian ransomware, we're going to have to be organized. We need the power of government pushing down at the same time as the power of industry and the power of the information security community and pushing into the same places. So it's information flow, but it's also trust, both of which don't come easily to government. Anyone else? Tried this? Oh, no. No, don't give me a microphone. It's not interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just about to say that uh, your beard is fantastic. And, and I tried to do that. It got really itchy. And any tips on that? Because uh, <laughs> drink lots of beer. <laughs> There's my mistake. Okay. <laughs> no further questions? Oh, oh. Uh, about the gap about organizations that might not have uh, the resources, like, like for example, an NGO or something that, you know. Uh, a, a lot of the problem there is just that they don't have the same amount of resources as a large organization to come and pay for the work. Uh, to a certain extent, you know, you can go and offer your help, but I don't know if you have any advice on what might be the best ways to actually go and help such an organization that does not have the resources, does not have the equipment, does not have the money, but what, do I, what, what can I actually do for them? So one of the first places to start is literally at the beginning. Um, I've been doing a little bit of work with the Cyber Peace Institute in, uh, uh, in Geneva. And what I've been pushing them towards is when you deploy NGOs or when you facilitate the deployment of NGOs into spaces, let's bake some cybersecurity in. If you start them with at least a reasonable security posture, then they're going to be way better off than just some random group dumping something into part of the African continent or, or, or into a disaster zone. So step one is 
you can get in there at the start and help guide them in terms of this is what you need to do. I mean, in some ways, it's almost like being a virtual CISO for a small startup. It's, okay, these are the resources we've got. This is how you do this in a, in a sensible and secure way. The, the next step is uh, the ongoing monitoring side of it. We can keep an eye on them and see when things come up because they're not going to be monitoring their infrastructure for the latest vulnerabilities that suddenly appear on Twitter or which get dropped into uh, MITRE or whatever. But we can do that. Um, in the CTI League, we were producing I know, somewhere in the region of two to 4,000 vulnerabilities a month just from using things like Shodan to keep scanning infrastructure. And so there's work that we can do that. The challenge is to make sure that you're tied into a good organization so that you have the reporting channels because you then run into the problems that we had in CTI Lake, which is, okay, you find this stuff. How do you get them to action it? And the second problem is, how do you get someone to physically make the changes to fix it? Because, you know, boots on the ground is not always practical. If you're talking about something like uh, uh, an earthquake disaster like, like Haiti, you're not going to fly someone out there to fix some vulnerable infrastructure. Um, so working with the NGOs themselves into understanding how to fix this stuff is good. Um, building tooling that will help them with stuff. Um, a lot of the vulnerabilities that these organizations suffer from are really quite simple. You know, they're things like uh, exposed services like RDP that should have should either be turned off or should have better security put in front of them, like strong passwords, multi-factor, so on and so forth. A lot of this stuff is is stuff that's actually not that hard to fix and not that hard to guide them on. Later on, we are going to have to deal with the bigger stuff. But honestly, if we deal with the low-hanging fruit, that's enough to keep us going for quite some time, and it's going to rule out like, a significant percentage of the attacks. Anybody, another question? Yes. There's a lot of issues with uh, the trust that's not there, but are there countries in the world where you think they're ahead of the game, where it's a lot easier to work with the governments and stuff, or? Ironically, I think the US is one of the places that's easier to work with, and I think a big part of that is because they had the loft moment. Um, the loft testifying in front of the Senate created a, a relationship and a view of opportunity that has helped drive things going forward. And so there is more opportunity in the US. And so when you look at the uh, number of law enforcement folks uh, on the CTI League, I would say probably 60 to 70 percent of them were US-based law enforcement as a result of that. Other countries are starting to catch up. Um, we've had good engagement from uh, a number of different European states. Um, actually had really surprising engagement from some, um, uh, some places like uh, um, uh, Vietnam and um, uh, South Korea. But I think most are still lagging because there is still fundamentally this, this distrust. And one of the challenges is they don't want a person who's not under their control to know what their weaknesses are. And so we have to show them that, you know, this information is already out there. It's not hard to scan this infrastructure and find, find problems. And if we can do it, anyone, any one of their enemies can do it. So the problem is not holding on to the information. Um, the problem is actually acting on that information fast enough. And I hope through uh, example, we're going to convince more and more states to do this especially given that if you look at the, the volume of attacks that has a, a, a arisen in you know, 2020, 2021, they're swamped. Like every law enforcement group in the world is completely swamped. And they know that they have to get help from somewhere. Um, I'm hoping they realize that you know, the help is right there. They just need to ask us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, 
see someone over there. Give me a sec. Thank you. Uh, not really a question, more of an offer. I am one of the people working for the Belgian government, so if anyone needs a place to go to with questions or remarks or any feedback on the government part, definitely just talk to me. Thanks. Now you open an invite, man. That's uh... <laughs> See, actually, this is, the, is stuff that's great. Um, in the past, you would have government representatives coming to conferences and they would fly under the radar as much as possible. In fact, you know, DEFCON created Spot the Fed for, the, for that very reason. But nowadays, it's a lot more open. And I think that openness is, at least I hope that openness is being driven by trust. And the fact that there, there is an opportunity for us to engage is great. Um, this year at DEFCON was kind of weird because of COVID, um, but we had a whole bunch of different agencies show up. The previous year, we had congressmen and senators show up and walk around and talk. Uh, that level of engagement is an opportunity that we would never would have seen five, ten years ago. And I kind of hope it continues. Uh, there's, there was some pushback when uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Moss, my boss, invited the secretary of DHS to come to DEF CON. And I have to admit, I had my own kind of conflicting views, like some of the stuff that DHS has done is very problematic. But at the same time, the opportunity to engage at that level is a really valuable opportunity for us to shape things and hopefully to change minds. And if we can change minds about just one aspect of what we do, that's going to impact us going forward in ways that breaking a website never would. Any more? Doesn't look like it. Any more questions? In that case, I can only say, Mark, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure picking your brain. It's literally our honor to have you here, man. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here, and I really hope to see more of you guys engage, because like, I'm getting old. <laughs> And I need some of you younger folks to come in and take over some of this stuff because we have an opportunity to change the world. And having you guys do that is my biggest wish. Thanks, man.